So my name is uh, Ivan Bjerdamgaard, and I'm a professor in computer science here at Aarhus University, and I'm also a scientific advisor for the Concordium project. And I'm here today to talk about something we call the ID layer of the Concordium system. Um, so the ID layer is something that uh, is useful um, because of the fact that, that the system is, is supposed to be used for financial transactions, you're moving money from, from, from A to B and, and trading with people. And there, it's of course important that you know that the party you're dealing with is actually say an existing person that is uh, a customer in a bank, is a citizen of some country, is over 18, let's say, um, because that's very important to be able to trust the transaction that, you, that you're doing actually ends up, the money ends up in the right place and so on. So, um, uh, on the other hand, of course, it's also very important that we respect the privacy of the people who use the system. And the idea layer is basically the system that, that takes care of all these problems. So, if we begin from the beginning, how do you become a user of the system? So, let, let's say we have uh, some person here. Let's say that that's me. Um, my initials there. Uh, and the first thing that happens here is you go to someone called an identity provider, the IP. This is a guy who is able to, who, who knows me, um, is able to verify that I'm me and is able to verify that certain, you know, personal pieces of information actually um, uh, is correct with, with respect to me, that I'm a Danish citizen, I'm a customer in this bank, I'm over 18, etc. Um, so I talk to this person. This could be a Danish state agency, let's say it could be a bank, some, some, someone who knows me enough and has some credibility system-wide. And once, once I say, you know, I'm, I'm me and all this information is actually something that, that describes me, um, then he will give me back, uh, once he checks this, of course, that I really, it's, it's really me he's talking to, uh, he would give me back something that we call an account holder certificate. So this thing is something you can think of as a digital passport, in a sense. So it's signed by this guy. There's a digital signature, as we call it. So it can be verified as actually being issued by this guy. Um, uh, and there's also a way in which I can prove this really is my certificate. So in that sense, um, it's like a passport in the sense that, you know, if I get a physical passport, I can verify this, this looks genuine, probably was issued by the Danish state. And also, uh, it can be uh, verified as belonging to me via the picture and the signature and so on. And we have digital ways of ensuring the same thing here. So, so you know, um, this, this thing is, is obviously, uh, by some checks you can do, it, this thing really was issued by this identity provider and it belongs to, in this case, me. Okay? So, then um, what you can do once you get this thing is you can open an account in the system. And so, so what, what is here is then something that would be visible to everyone. So, so here's an account. Um, and then there is some, some account holder information that would be part of this account. This is something that would be visible to everyone immediately as soon as the account is opened. Um, and what the way this is created is you use this account holder certificate to create this stuff there. So um, what's important to realize here is that what is here is not a copy of this thing, because if it was, then that would contain my name and, and all my personal information. And this would not be a very good idea with respect to privacy. Because what happens after you open the account, of course, is that now you can start paying money to other people and you can receive payments from elsewhere. So if it was visible to everyone that this was actually my account, then that would mean that, that my total financial life would be completely public and we, we probably wouldn't want that. Um, so what is here instead is, let's say, part of the information that's here. So uh, for instance, you could choose here to reveal that this was a Danish citizen. This is a guy who was more than 18 years old, let's say, and is a customer in, let's say, some, some Nordic bank like Nordea or something like this, right? Um, so, so you can think of this as it's, if this is, was an ID card, this is, this is an ID card where parts of the information on the card has been covered up, so you can't see it all. 
you can still verify that this was issued. This is a genuine card that was issued by this guy. This is still verifiable from the information that's there. Uh, and also that it's actually, this account is opened by someone who actually owned the underlying certificate. So, so in that sense, it's exactly equivalent to, you know, kind of uh, a passport that's only partially opened. Um, and what this means then is that anybody who deals with this account only knows that they'll be, they're talking to someone who is from, from this country, has this age and so on, and, and not that this is actually me. Okay? So in this way, we have some, some, some limited form of, of, of anonymity here. Okay. Um, then um, another thing which is important to say is that it's possible for the same person to open several different accounts. Um, so I could open you know, a different account here using that same account holder certificate as before. And now the account holder information, I could choose to, to be, for instance, more open here and actually reveal this really is me. Then my, my ID would be completely visible here um, and all, all the rest of the stuff, of course. Uh, but what is important to say is that it, it's not going to be obvious that, or it's not going to be knowable at all, that this is the same person that's behind this account as is behind this one. That's where the analogy with the passport breaks down a little bit, because you know, if, if you had shown the same passport several times, even if parts of it had been covered up, it would probably be obvious that it was the same passport. This is not, this is not the case here. We're able to do certain tricks with things called randomizations and zero knowledge proofs and stuff like this, which means that it's, 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 um, it's impossible to tell whether these two accounts belong to the same person or not. Uh, so in this way, you will be able to, to handle some parts of your business with a very large level of anonymity and other parts maybe uh, where it's necessary that people know exactly who they're dealing with, we can actually do this as well. So, so one potential problem with this, of course, that you might be wondering about now is whether this cannot be misused. Um, it's well known that, that uh, for instance, in the world of, of, um, uh, of Bitcoin, that, um, that this has been misused by criminals to accept bribes or ransoms and stuff like this um, uh, because, because criminals hope that they will be able to do this anonymously via Bitcoin. Bitcoin isn't really that anonymous after all. That's a different part of the story. But, 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 um, but of course, this is also an issue here. And if there was nothing else in the system, then, then, this, then this would indeed be open to misuse of this type. So um, here one can think of, of an analogy also to, to, the, to the physical world, the non-digital world. Um, so my, my, the letters, the paper letters I send uh, are private. My, that privacy is protected by law, also the privacy of my phone conversations. Um, but nevertheless, if the police has, 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 uh, can prove that they have a good suspicion against me that, that, that I'm doing something criminal, then they can get a, from, from a court of law, they can, they can get its permission to open my letters and, and eavesdrop my, my phone conversations. And in the same way, we have in the system here an option for having the anonymity of an account revoked under special control circumstances. So the way this is done is, is inside this account here, there is also um, a piece of encrypted data. So there's an encryption here, right this way, um, of, let's just say, uh, my actual identity here. This is also a part of what's in the account. This is, of course, visible, but since this, this is an encryption, it's just, it just looks like gibberish. It, it's, it's totally uh, impossible to tell that, that, that you know, underlying is actually my name or my identity. And then this encryption can actually be opened um, under certain circumstances. So the idea is that we will have um, uh, the concept of an anonymity revoker. So this would be an entity let's say, with, with a certain legal credibility. A court of law, uh, some state agency, some big organization, whatever. And there might be several of these people. So let's say anonymity revokers, there could be several of them. AR1, AR2, AR3. Let's just say as an example, we have three. Um, what you can then set up is that these people are given 
secret information that only they have. So they have a secret key, secret key number one, secret key number two, secret key number three. And then um, this encryption here was created in such a way that there's a special relation between it and those secret keys there. And the result of this is that if at least, let's say two of these go together, they would be able to open this. But one of these guys by, by itself can do nothing. So, so the idea would be that, that if, um, if um, at least two ARs um, agree, so agree to, to revoke anonymity here, um, uh, then this is possible. So if they are convinced by the police that there's just cause to open this thing, they, they can go and look at this and tell you what the identity actually was. Um, but uh, one AR can do nothing. Okay, so, so if you only have this and one of these secret keys, this together will tell you absolutely nothing about who I am. So that's an, in order to protect against misuse, of course, that um, we want to have as much, as much trust as possible in the system, so we're not going to allow just one of these guys to do anything by themselves. This, by the way, is something you can tweak exactly as you like. You can have five of these guys and demand the three of them must be enough to, to, uh, to evoke anonymity, whereas only two of them can do nothing. And this, this is completely up to, let's say, the legal system and the political system to decide how this should be set up. Um, finally, if, if one thing to mention perhaps also is that uh, you might be wondering about these, these, these payment transactions here. Uh, you might say, well, it's, it's all good and fine that that uh, these accounts don't reveal who is actually involved. But one might think that maybe, maybe if, if these payments were visible, then maybe the amounts that were involved would, would reveal something. Um, and so uh, what we can say here is that payments usually would contain uh, encrypted amounts. So in other words, uh, what that means, therefore, is that what is visible from the outside is that some payment has traveled from account A to account B, but you wouldn't be able to see what the amount was. Um, this, of course, means when I pay, I'll have to prove that the encrypted amount I'm sending is not more than I actually have on my account, so I can't spend more than I have. And this is done via something called zero-knowledge proofs, so it means that with every payment comes some verification information that, you c that everybody can check and, and, and tell that indeed this was a valid payment transaction. So that's that's some further protection you can have.